bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, the Holland Bloorview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation, and the Children's Hospital Foundation of Saskatchewan. We would also like to thank the following Keystone and program partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. If you have any questions or comments for our panelists, please type them into the question box at any time during the presentation. You can also share your thoughts and questions on Twitter by tagging at CAFC Tweets and using the hashtag CAFC Presents. All of our webinars are recorded and can be found on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. Use the CAN to share these recordings with your colleagues or register an account and post comments, links, or other resources that you think will be of interest. And be sure to sign up for the CAFC Presents weekly email newsletter to stay up to date with upcoming webinars and our recorded webinar archive. everyone, and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. I'm Doug Maynard, Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. Before we uh, go any further, I would like to acknowledge uh, that we do have a new KT partner uh, that we always rec we recognize all of our KT partners in our opening credits. Uh, we have a new partner who has joined us to support our KT activities, and that includes uh, our CAFC Presents webinar program, Trillium Health Partners, uh, which is a group of hospitals serving Mississauga, the Halton Peel region, and West Toronto, has joined us, and we will, of course, be adding their logo to the opening credits, but I wanted to give them special recognition today and thank them for their generous support of this program that allows us to keep these webinars uh, free and open to anyone who's, who wants to join. So on with today's uh, webinar, which is titled Cross-Sectoral Partnerships for Integrating Services for Children and Youth, Reaching for the Sky, and that is Sky spelled S-S-C-Y, which stands for Specialized Services for Children and Youth, which is a new facility in Winnipeg that is a collaboration and integration of a number of centers and services in Winnipeg that includes one of our long-standing CAFC members, uh, RCC, which is the Rehab Center for Children, and it's a, it's a great story of services working collaboratively and in partnership across ministries in, in a in an attempt to focus more fully on the needs of, the, of children and families as the center of services, and that's really the interesting story to be told here. Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome uh, one of our presenters, uh, who is Cheryl Szynski, and I'm sure needs no introduction to many, as she's a long-standing member of the CAFC community, former CAFC board member, leader in our CINSER network, that's the Canadian Network for Child and Youth Rehab. Uh, Cheryl is currently the executive director of the Rehab Center for Children. Uh, uh, in Winnipeg, uh, and she's also the uh, acts as the community services director for the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority Child Health Program, and she's also the co-chair for the Sky Centers uh, site management team. And joining uh, Cheryl is uh, Jeanette Edwards. Uh, she is the regional director of primary health care and chronic disease with the Winnipeg uh, Regional Health Authority, and in this capacity, Jeanette has facilitated this, this, the, Sky Centers, uh, in it, the Sky Center initiative. Uh, Jeanette is also second on a second seconded on a part-time basis to Manitoba Health in the capacity of special advisor to the Deputy Minister on Primary Care. Uh, so uh, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to uh, hand the virtual podium over to uh, Cheryl and Jeanette. Over to you guys. Thank you very much, um, it's Jeanette speaking. I'm just going to double check. Can you see our first slide okay? Can. Perfect. We're just a little afraid that technology is not in order. Um, <laughs> we're delighted to uh, present the story to you. There's a long slide deck, so we'll be going fairly rapidly. And uh, we've deliberately made it long so that the story is here for you to access. What we'll be going through uh, with you this morning is the vision, the principles, and the su success factors, and really talking about how we set out to reconfigure a, really an entire service system for children and youth with special needs. So our journey began in 2000. Um, first and foremost, we started this out really looking at what should our design principles be. I should tell you, in bringing uh, partners together who in the past and for many years have actually been competitors, uh, that this step became our very first step. 
and we began to start looking at key issues such as the principles of primary health care, well documented by the World Health Organization's population health principles. We are deliberately talking about a targeted population of children and youth, social service reform and change management. So we'll be briefly going over these with you. Our change management principles um, that, we, that we've uh, lifted here from uh, Cotter 2007 will be speaking to each of these um, one by one to really identify how we apply these principles to our practice. A little bit of history. In uh, 1993, so this goes back several years, there were uh, several documents, one beginning with the framework of healthy development and uh, and uh, for children in Manitoba, Dr. Brian Postel had done several reports. So you can see here a listing of reports, many of which were sitting on shelves and we took the opportunity to apply evidence. So why did we need SKY? Uh, first and foremost, as I said, we had 10 years of reports. Families identified the system was incredibly difficult to navigate. Um, as in uh, many provinces across the country, uh, services for children and youth with special needs um, were and still are funded by three distinct departments, and so we had a very complex funding system. Families were saying they had to keep retelling their story. One mother came in and asked if we could fund her to have her own case coordinator to manage her case coordinators. So that gives you a, a real sense of what uh, the system was like from a child, family, client perspective. The other thing that happened, which uh, we actually is a blessing in uh, disguise, is Rehab Center for Children was located in uh, a very old facility, the previously known Shriners Hospital. And it was slowly sliding into the river as it's on the riverbank and the bank was eroding. This was a perfect opportunity to take a crisis and turn it into an opportunity. So we really, at that point, had to look at a next key principle, is how would we get leadership commitment from all of the partners, including three different funders. We put together, and I won't go through the pain of change uh, with you, but we've put together a working group which is in fact still in place today called the Sky IWG or Intersectoral Working Group. And this quick slide shows you the partners where you've got your three key government departments, the funders at the top, and where we began to bring in many, many partners, some of which are co-locating partners at the Sky Center and others are non. should also let you know that as we put this together and after a lot of collaborative work and trying to bring partners together to agree upon a vision, we also recognized that this task was huge, had many components, and we really needed to apply some project management principles and develop task teams. And these are identified uh, for you on the right-hand side of your page. One last comment, you see families in blue on the left side of your page. On every single committee throughout the 17 years we've been doing this, a family representative has been engaged and meaningfully involved. Bringing those folks together, we next needed to move to some serious visioning and to see if we could get commitment to a shared vision and culture. As a result of uh, facilitated sessions, we did develop a charter, a project charter, and here you will see, and it stands today, that we have partners who collectively came together and agreed to develop a coordinated and integrated service system to maximize the effectiveness and efficiency of all of our services. And you'll see below some key features that we felt would help us begin that journey together. So it's important to note here that this was about service, not a center. The building now is really the last enabling tool. So there's some key features that we began long before bricks and mortar. And that was developing a central intake system, identifying lead case coordinators and using those principles, looking at seamless transitions between services, 
uh, looking at the options and the opportunities that would come with co-location, not necessarily essential for all, and also a family resource center. Um, it should be noted when we began this journey, each organization had its own resource center and we were really trying to make this family centered. This next slide is uh, another key principle that we use, which was the project management approach. And you'll see that we try to break our immediate issues into bite-sized increments. And I'll quickly review these uh, for you. Uh, the first one was certainly looking at a family engagement team. And uh, that first task was looking at the Family Resource Center, where we did not have a agency resource center, but we actually, this was the first time that we used SKY, the acronym, and made it a multi-agency partner. And you'll see we also accessed some donor dollars at the outset to establish this. This center remains intact today and is now a key part of the SKY building. We looked at also making sure that our principles were around not just family representation on committees, but in fact, authentic engagement. And this work has actually led to now a family advisory council for SKY. But it was important for us to make sure we had involvement of not just our community and our staff, and we were very clear about accountabilities where we could work together. And this slide just indicates some of those activities, and you can see the real focus and intent of engagement, for example, the staff forms, and you can see the dates and how we ensured engagement throughout. So what did we hear when we began this process? Um, again, we talked to staff, we talked to families, and clearly the messages were that this should not be an institution feel, it should be community. A quote from a family was, my child is not sick, I don't want a hospital feel. At the same time, the location needed to be close to the Health Sciences Center where our specialists uh, do the majority of their work, but also provide clinics at the uh, Rehab Center for Children. So it needed to be close, but not too close. Many of the clients that um, uh, are seeking support and assistance and families um, live out of Winnipeg, so we also needed to be close to airports, buses, as well as traffic routes. It needed to be a building that didn't go up, but in fact sideways. Uh, we wanted a building where services were integrated into sort of a common space where as, as close as possible. It needed to be close to amenities, and again, because I mentioned our rural northern population, close to a hotel with inexpensive shuttle services. I'll quickly just flip through these slides so you see some of the comments we heard from staff around reception and also from families. So this is a list of those. Here's a list of uh, comments we heard from families around the resource center and what they wanted to see in a resource center environment. Here are examples of parking and entranceway. I can't stress this one enough. It was quite remarkable how parking became a number one issue. There were certainly some, uh, or a family in particular, that was most concerned there was an underground parking and another family who disagreed with underground parking. So you will see that we've moved to a covered protected parking space so that we could work within budget and what was within reasonable. But this became a very important uh, component. Uh, the families in this consultation also asked for valet parking and uh, uh, somebody to assist them, so Cheryl will explain how we address those. Clinical working spaces, it was very clear that uh, staff and clients wanted to ensure that we had good-sized clinic rooms, that there was certainly ergonomic and enough space for families, there needed to be student areas and so on. Other dreams, it was important for us to hear the dreams, but certainly around meeting rooms, the ability to accommodate other community groups coming in, lots of natural light, and so on. So I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl to talk about our service teams. Thanks, Jeanette. So Jeanette and I are just switching seats here for a second. 
so while the team was working on the building uh, aspects of things, the front end and direct services task teams were looking at reconfiguring the system so that it would operate in a more integrated way even in advance of co-location. Uh, and we did that through looking at three aspects, including intake or access to the system, uh, service coordination or navigation through the system, and also the direct service delivery components, particularly focusing on physio, OT, speech, and audiology. Uh, the intake component and the direct service were greatly facilitated through a sky-related initiative that was happening in the province at the time called the Children's Therapy Initiative where we were really trying to um, provide a more integrated uh, approach to therapy services despite the fact that there were three different funders involved uh, and different eligibility criteria um, at the time and for services. Uh, so the way that this initiative worked was uh, the government actually put some money on the table for coalitions that would come together and plan in partnership. And that money was to actually increase therapy services and to look at intake systems. And this is just an example of the partnership that came together in Winnipeg, which you, you can see includes the seven different school division in Winnipeg, also the facility-based um, therapy services and some of the outreach therapy services from different agencies. And there were similar partnerships to this uh, in regions across the province. Uh, so one of the first key outcomes of uh, the Children's Therapy Initiative was central intake uh, system. So uh, instead of having multiple agencies with multiple waiting lists, uh, we were able to bring them all together into one late waiting list. So we had a really true waiting time picture because uh, children weren't duplicated on different uh, lists. We were also, through this system, able to triage to the first uh, available provider at the most appropriate uh, location, uh, rather than being stuck on one list in one agency for two years when you could have got into another agency earlier. Uh, and we were, for the first time, able to produce aggregate data to the system. And this central intake really became the nucleus of what would become the Sky Central Intake System in our new building, uh, where we eventually expanded beyond uh, the four therapy disciplines uh, to other Sky services as well. Um, so in terms of the actual service delivery part of it, uh, we broke people up into discipline-specific working groups to, again, look at how we could really configure the system to uh, make the maximum use of our resources. And we built heavily uh, through this on the work of Dr. Rebecca Readers from Cincinnati Children's Hospital. So we had her to Winnipeg several times uh, to really get grounded in some of her concepts around episodes of care, needs-based approach to frequency, managing expectations, and then removing barriers uh, to reentry. And this was applied across all the three disciplines. Uh, additionally, in terms of the maximizing resources, we, uh, we looked at um, some specific projects around uh, fine motor training for kindergarten teachers. So that was applied by OTs across the system with some follow-up uh, uh, OT support uh, to just get the message out in a much bigger way. And also parent training models on the speech side. And the combination of these uh, initiatives really reduced our wait times uh, considerably across the system uh, and also just uh, allowed us to ha deliver a much more consistent service in between the agencies so that you uh, what you could reasonably expect going to the various agencies became uh, much, much more similar. On the service coordination side, uh, we also were working on really moving towards the development of a single service coordinator for families. So we really focused on kids with complex medical needs who at the time might have had three case coordinators, one from Society for Manitobans with Disabilities, one from Home Care, and one for Family Services. Uh, we brought those case coordinators together and uh, developed a project whereby one case coordinator could access the services from all three agencies so that the family actually only had to interface with one person. And that, that model has continued as we've moved into the new Sky Center. Uh, so while we were working on the system reconfiguration, the intersectoral working group was, was plugging away um, at some of the higher level leadership things. And we're now talking, we're into like year seven, year eight, year nine, uh, that we've been working on this project uh, by this point. So some of the key things they were looking at were, first of all, a data sharing agreement, uh, which literally took years to get into place, that would allow the seven different co-locating agencies to actually share an electronic medical record within Sky Center, and we started implementing that record even in advance of co-location. This team was also looking at uh, what kind of operating budget we would need for 
sky and you know putting those into regional health plans which had to do, be done three years in advance, uh, launching a capital campaign and the main thing they were doing is just pushing the capital project and you can see I've got a little circle around Jeanette here uh, because um, I think this was going over years at this point and most of us had pretty much given up that it was ever going to happen uh, but Jeanette just never gave up. She just continued through Minister of Health after Minister of Health through change of government through change of CEOs of Health Authority to push this project and I think having a change champion that really will just never give up and keep, keep going at it uh, was a real critical success factor for us in getting this ultimately done. Uh, so finally, after years and years, you remember we started in the year 2000, we're now at May 2012, uh, we had all the approvals into place and had our, had our groundbreaking on our uh, new center. Uh, in parallel with that groundbreaking, we launched a capital campaign uh, called Together is Better. Uh, so we actually brought together three foundations, uh, three of the co-locating partners actually had foundations. They came together to form a steering committee uh, where we uh, put together a cabinet and raised $5.2 million in addition to the government contribution, uh, which really allowed us to put some really family-friendly features and some technologically uh, cool features into this uh, new building, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, so at this time also, we kind of finalized the list of co-locating services. As you can appreciate, over 12 years, uh, people kind of, some people came, some people went, some people came back again. Uh, we went, went around in numerous circles over the time, but this was the group uh, that actually uh, ended up moving into the new building. So we had community respite services, we had services from the Department of Families, we had a new child care center that was a fully integrated center, but with a focus on children with special needs services from Society for Manitomans with Disability, some of our uh, St. Amant services which includes intake and their early autism, they have the ABA type program, uh, a lot of services from uh, Winnipeg Regional Health Authority including a number from Children's Hospital that moved out of the hospital and into our community center and, like Child Development Clinic and the High Risk Follow-Up Program in our FASD Diagnostic Center as well as a number of their rehab services and pediatric home care uh, moved into the building as well. And then all of the services for re from Rehab Center for Children uh, which as Jeanette said previously was the old Shriners building so uh, included a number of pediatric specialty clinics uh, as well as rehab engineering, uh, all kinds of different therapy services, therapeutic recreation, uh, research component, fa the family resource center that we had worked on together and, uh, and our foundation moved as well. So while uh, once the co-locators had been firmly declared, we established a site management team which included representation from each kind of co-locating program. So these were all the managers that ultimately ended up moving uh, into the building and they started meeting in earnest around developing shared operating guidelines for how we were actually going to function together in the building which included everything from emergency and evacuation procedures to infection to control to how we were going to book rooms and all of those kind of details to actually uh, make this thing work. They worked very intensively with uh, a capital um, group from the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority that was actually responsible for the capital project. Uh, and that project took, went over a four year period beginning in October 2012 uh, right to facility opening in spring of 2016 and this was actually two construction projects uh, within one project because it was a lease building so we had a landlord construction project where they worked on the base building and then a tenant improvement uh, construction project was the second two year um, period uh, that took us up to 2016. Uh, in addition to getting an award for accessibility for this building, we also uh, were deemed a LEED Silver building so there was a lot of, through the construction process, an ongoing um, energy efficiency uh, components built into it. And just to give you an idea of some before and after pictures, this is where we started. Uh, there was actually a train that used to run through this building. It was the old Christie Biscuits building in, uh, in Winnipeg on Notre Dame and Wall for those of you who know Winnipeg. Uh, and this gives you a shot uh, just when the, the base building construction was going on. You can see it had some really nice skylights uh, across that we were really able to use for our tenant improvement phase. So for the tenant improvements, we really focused on uh, neighborhood as a design concept or in community. Uh, and therefore, the building is kind of, which is laid out on two levels, is split into neighborhoods, uh, which we actually used uh, kind of in a color coding way to assist with wayfinding. 
you notice they all have catchy names like Ability Acres instead of Occupational Therapy and Physiotherapy, and partly that was done for the capital campaign. Each of these neighborhoods were sold for $250,000, which is how we got to the $5.2 million. So the daycare, and, which is Kids Corner, and most of the clinical services are, uh, were on the main floor of the building. And the second floor includes uh, Rehab Engineering, which is Innovation Place, and a uh, bank of meeting room, telehealth room type areas, as well as uh, Success Heights, which includes our foundation, some corporate offices, and all of the outreach workers who work uh, out of the building. This is a shot of the building from the front, and as you can see, the, uh, part of the parking problem was solved by covered canopies, with, which some child deemed as wings, so they've been known as wings uh, ever since, and I can report are working really well in keeping the snow um, off people. And this is our shared reception and intake as you first come into the building. And that desk that you see there actually has uh, a concierge sitting at it who is, in fact, a rehab assistant that uh, part of the parking solution uh, was that this person can now help uh, families uh, unload equipment from their cars, take equipment around the building, they watch their child while they're parking their car, park their car for them if they want, and assist with uh, wayfinding in the building. We also have a common reception area for the seven different agencies that have um, moved into the building. So as you'll notice as we do a virtual tour of this building that uh, there's no agency names listed. We want to present one service to the family irrespective of who the employer is. So other than the sign out the front of the building, uh, you're not going to see any agency names uh, anywhere in the building. Uh, so just adjacent to the reception there, you see we have Central Park because it's Winnipeg and we have lots of winter here. We wanted an indoor play area <coughs> where kids could um, and families could relax. We have a lot of people who come uh, from northern and rural areas for appointments. They're here all day. Uh, so in addition uh, to um, being a relaxing place for families, it also doubles as a therapy area. The windows you see rimming around that building uh, that Central Park are actually the OT, PT, Ability Acres uh, department, so they also use this space as a therapy space. So you can see we've introduced some elements into it that you might find out in the community setting so we can practice mobility. There's a bridge and, and things like that. Uh, there's a waterfall, so we have a lot of sensory el elements built in. Uh, just to the right of the waterfall there is a wall that has fossils uh, built into it. Uh, as well, and um, different things like sound cones uh, are in the building, so in this area, so you can hear uh, different uh, bird calls and things like that. We have bubbles on the floor through a gesture check system that the children can play in, and lots of soft seating and things like that. And the kids and families absolutely love this area. Uh, this is the uh, general waiting area. You can see reception down at the end there. Uh, our donor wall is there on the left, and so that is again for families waiting for appointments, and it's just adjacent to the Family Resource Center, where we have lots of uh, books, videos, print materials on different kinds of disabilities, so if people are, uh, receive a diagnosis of autism or something like that, they can come right down here and get various books on autism and also have somebody assist. Uh, we have internet access for families in this area, and it also houses our therapeutic recreation and uh, volunteer program. Uh, this is another thing that families ask for. They have, uh, we have lockers for families so they can store stuff during the day, and we also have adjacent to each waiting uh, area, a quiet waiting area, so if there's children with sensory issues or people who need a break because they're there all day long, they can have a place where they can go and shut the door and make phone calls or relax. Um, this is another thing that families really wanted. It's an accessible uh, shower. Uh, people say that often they come to city, the city and they don't have anywhere they can give their child a bath, so we let people come and use the center for that purpose. Uh, and so we've built this uh, accessible washroom that even if they're not coming for appointments, if they're just in the city or driving through, uh, they can come and use this shower. And this is another view of it from the other end. Uh, we have great tracking systems all around the building, height adjustable, change tables, etc. So getting into some of the clinical areas, uh, this is rehab engineering, which is innovation station. You can just see off to the right there, uh, there's a uh, wall, wall that we've cut through to allow kids to watch their equipment uh, being worked on, and this includes both prosthetics and orthotics and mechanical design uh, and services. Those are the transfer papers on the wall there that children can put in onto their uh, braces or limbs. 
Um, and this is a, the shop for mechanical design and services where we work on seating systems, uh, different kinds of recreational mobility things, um, you know, adapted bicycles, uh, walkers, standing frames, those kinds of things. Uh, there is the shot into the machine room again. And this is our assistive technology clinic room, which as you can see is a huge room and um, easily accommodates all the children and the families and their equipment and the therapist and the orthopedic surgeon and, and the engineering technicians. And here's a shot in the prosthetics and orthotics area where uh, the, the biggest excitement in this area is with our capital campaign funds, we were able to purchase a uh, 3D carver um, and so we are now able to scan limbs rather than using plaster and um, store computer generated uh, images. So this has greatly uh, increased the efficiency of this service. Uh, and then it, these are just some shots of some clinic rooms and we can go rel relatively quickly through here. Um, this is another area. You can see each area has a threshold and uh, is a different color. So um, on the left there, you can see smile tiles on the wall. That was part of our capital campaign was for people who wanted to do donate at lower levels, $100, $250, they could purchase smile tiles that have things written on them uh, for friends or loved ones. Uh, in this area, we have our multidisciplinary specialty clinics. Um, and this is a common waiting area for those clinics. Uh, so this is a typical assessment room for child development clinic, uh, Manitoba FASD, diagnostic clinic, and high-risk follow-up clinic. So there's an observation room uh, mirror built onto the side of that, as you can see. This is our team conference uh, area for these multidisciplinary clinics. And here we have a larger kind of uh, more medical style exam room for things like muscular dystrophy clinic, spina bifida clinic, and the spine clinics. Uh, we have a digital x-ray built into this building, uh, and which allows us to hook up to Children's Hospital and have x-rays right around the province. And the funny thing about this x-ray system is that the children can choose the color that they want the x-ray to be, so that uh, gives them a little more control over the room. And this gives you a shot of the uh, feeding clinic, which is one of our multidisciplinary clinics that includes feeding specialists, OTs, dietitians, uh, social work. And we're into another neighborhood, Speech and Hearing Junction. As you can see, we've now gone into the green air neighborhood where we have uh, audiology clinics, our high-risk follow-up program, and, and also speech language pathology. And there's a shot of the audiology booth. Uh, so there's a typical setup for the speech room uh, where we have uh, just regular outpatient speech therapy, speech therapy that supports our multidisciplinary clinics and as well uh, augmentative and alternative uh, communications in this area. Uh, this is one of my favorite areas of the building, Kids Care Corner. It is a fully licensed daycare, uh, but it has a focus on children with special needs as well as being available for the community at large and for the staff. So it's 50 spaces. And this is one of the specialty rooms we've built into this daycare for kids with complex medical needs. So if they need uh, special treatments or uh, a break during the day, uh, they can uh, access this uh, room here. And this is this another room we've built into this daycare for kids with complex sensory needs, so children with FAS or autism who can't handle the full day in the regular program have a place where they can go with their support worker and get a break. So uh, this daycare is available to anybody who can access it uh, that needs a protected place to start in so they can build up their tolerance until they can handle their own uh, community daycare. And these are just some other shots of the daycare. You can see the windows we've built around the building are all kid height. Uh, and this is the infant area of the daycare. And then this is our outside play area that doubles both for the daycare and all guy families. We've tried to make it lots of natural elements. Uh, we've got water tables out there and uh, kind of living archways, a hill, uh, some therapeutic uh, gardening boxes built at wheelchair height type of things for our gardening program. Uh, TP, we needed some, this is a pretty windy place, so we needed a little bit of shelter uh, out there, and um, kids, kids love this TP. And some musical things uh, around and some climbing rocks, and different, different features like that. Ability Acres is the physio OT area, as I said before, and this is pretty typical uh, for most physio OT things. We have a gym that looks into Central Park so kids can uh, look out while they're doing their uh, exercise and this is a typical OT assessment room. 
uh, OT group room where we run lots of different groups like how does your engine run, different self-regulation type things, an ADL suite so we can do assessments for what children may need in their homes, uh, physio-orthopedic uh, area, and then we also have renovation station which is basically just a garage where we do car seat assessments and as well that houses our equipment loan uh, type program. Upstairs we have the meeting place <clears throat> which is just a number of different meeting rooms, uh, two of which are equipped uh, with telehealth and a foyer for the meeting room area. This is a large meeting room that can go between 60 and 90 people depending on if you open up uh, walls. Uh, and then the final area in the upstairs is our uh, outreach workers. Uh, this area is called Success Height and this gives you a list of who's in this area. It's all of the people who work out in home schools and daycares so that includes respite workers uh, as well as uh, case coordinators and physios, OTs, speech language pathologists that do outreach services, autism outreach team uh, and those kinds of people are all in this type of area here and that's uh, typical of their cubicle. And that's the virtual tour of the building. So I'm just going to turn it back to Jeanette here just to conclude. I'm sure folks are feeling like you literally ran through the building. Um, the physical space has been a wonderful opportunity now that everybody's moved to really step back and look at some of the principles of integration. Uh, integration isn't a happening, it's a process. And this is something that we've used across the health system um, in Manitoba, but in this case it's really been a fabulous example of how you need to move from fragmented service delivery and through the process of understanding relationship building before you can possibly get to integration, which requires not just the development of a vision statement, but in fact ensuring that all partners embrace common values and a holistic approach. So what are our next steps? Um, Cheryl and I often talk about this and um, we need to be careful that our SKY partnership, many members are now in the SKY Center, never become stagnant and that we in fact bring our vision forward and start looking towards the future. So uh, these are just a couple of call-outs that we have uh, developed thus far and we are moving our intersectoral working group that you saw was developed some 16, 17 years ago, moving that group forward on how do we bring partners together now not just to embrace and sustain the common vision but move forward onto some common strategic planning uh, priorities. Emerging issues that are coming up, we've uh, developed evaluation in a research group. It's very important for us to always reflect on how have we applied evidence and are we in fact through all this work achieving and addressing the issues that we showed you at the very beginning of this presentation around fragmented services. We're also seeing emerging populations. We're seeing the need to enhance connection and integration with mental health, adolescent mental health. We're moving forward into some very serious conversations on how do we partner with, not do for, but engage our First Nations communities and certainly within a spirit of cultural safety and respecting um, diversity. And certainly the ever-ending discussion point is transition between sectors of the health system, particularly into adulthood. So on that uh, very rapid summary, and it's um, very difficult to explain 17 years of work in 45 minutes, uh, but we wanted to make sure we left enough time for any questions or comments, and particularly if there are areas that you'd like some more detailed information. Thank you very much, and we'll turn it back to the host. All right. Thank you very much. A fantastic presentation. Those pictures were, were incredible. It's it such a beautiful facility. And I did notice you kept the uh, Christy Biscuit sign up on top of the roof, it looked like, in the one picture. Yeah, it's a historical building, so, uh, so that sign will be with us. Uh, uh, the first question that came in, uh, uh, and of course while we're waiting for others to uh, type their questions in, please do type your questions into the question box and, or comments as well. It doesn't have to be just questions. But uh, the first question came in from Francesca. She's just asking, are there any uh, child life specialists on staff in the center? 
We have a therapeutic recreation program that uh, does a lot of child life type activities, including um, gardening therapy, music therapy. We have summer camps going over the summer. We have family bike days um, and cooking clubs after school and a number of activities that occur both in the center but also on an outreach basis. Uh, we use uh, different schools around the uh, areas for some of those activities and also take them out to some rural, rural locations as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, a couple of the questions are sort of about integration in general. Uh, I'm just curious as to whether you've, uh, what your opinion is, for either one of you are welcome to, 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 to speak to this, but just so, sort of the, what your, your impression is across the country. Have you heard from other organizations across the country that are experiencing, going through this experience or considering some type of integration? Uh, we have people on the call from the Ottawa Children's Treatment Centre in Ottawa here where they, they're just starting the process of integrating with the Children's Hospital here. That's more of a, I guess, more within the sort of the health space. You've integrated more across, done more work across uh, ministries, but I'm just wondering what your thoughts are, what you've heard from across the country, or just sort of your, your impression of what the temperature is around integration. Is it the trend? Is it still just a couple of hot spots? Or what, just, just your opinion on that? Perhaps I'll start with that. It's Jeanette speaking. Um, as the system evolves, as uh, resources become tight, as deficits are being addressed, the structures are being changed, um, I think many people are beginning to truly reconsider what do we mean by integration. So systemically in healthcare, as we deal with patient flow, wait lists, what we are actually uncovering is many of those issues are related to fragmented services, duplication of services, repetitive assessments, and so on. Um, I think this process has really helped us understand what does integration mean, and I think we need to think about that carefully. Across the country, we've had many, many people aware of SKY um, and a few other initiatives who have actually come here to look at um, not the question of whether or not to integrate, but actually looking at the how-to. So I think we often underestimate the process versus the concept. Cheryl? Yeah, and I think people are at varying stages and varying places. I think, for example, uh, lots of rural areas are much farther ahead in integration than lots of, lots of urban areas. It's just the way they work. Uh, so I think there are some good examples uh, across the country of integration um, in process in, in various places, sometimes just across health, but uh, sometimes across different sectors as well. I think you find m many multi-sector uh, agencies, particularly in smaller, uh, smaller locations. Uh, Anne is asking if you can elaborate on your intake process. She's asking, do you have one standard referral form for all services? Yeah, particularly for the four uh, therapy disciplines, uh, we have um, physio, OT, speech, and audiology all on one for referral form, which is, of course, different segments of it, depending so that uh, issues can be identified. And that, that's for all providers of those services. Um, in kind of each region, we, they have a standard form for that. Uh, in terms of Sky Services, uh, in general, uh, we have two ways to get in. You can get in through central intake or you can get in directly. So if there's relationships set up between physicians and the physician and feeding clinic, they can refer directly to that, but it's all registered centrally uh, because the electronic medical record uh, holds us all together. Or if somebody is new to, new to the city or they don't know where they're going or they're really not sure what's going on with this child, uh, they can start at the central intake and then be triaged to the appropriate Sky service as well. Um, Susan is asking, uh, does each agency maintain its own leadership structure or is there one organizational structure slash leadership structure for the entire group? Um, it's Jeanette speaking. This was a very interesting question. When we began this process, each organization was incredibly threatened and literally people would storm out of meetings and I'm not going to work with so-and-so. We've been very clear that this was not about a takeover, a government takeover, a regional takeover. And our commitment was always about how do we maintain each of the partners governance structure. We have developed common tables to address site management uh, 
issues and so on, common forms, but it's through collaboration versus ownership. So the employees in the center actually have different employers of record depending on the organization. And uh, conceptually at the outset, what we said we were trying to do, build a shopping mall you really don't pay attention to um, I'll meet you at such and such a place that you actually talk about I'm going to such and such a mall and that's exactly how we've modeled it. Uh, our next step is working towards more collaboration between the governing structures and keeping in mind that several of our partners have services here but not all of their services agency actually has other services in other rural locations or elsewhere in the city. And having said that, where we kind of worked with each organization's strength. So where Rehab Center for Children actually had maintenance and housekeeping staff, we brought those group over to, to provide service for the whole. Um, and so we've kind of, because we had that infrastructure, we have taken a bit of a lead role in the facility management aspect of um, of sky type of thing, but the decisions about how we operate are very much made at that common uh, site management table. And um, area, you know, some areas, some agencies have some distinct areas in the building, but we've um, on that virtual tour, we very much integrated the services around. So in the child development clinic hallway, for example, we have the social worker from family services that uh, the children, if they receive a diagnosis, would transition to. So that person's right there and part of that team. Similarly, St. Amant is in that hallway as well. So if they're going to ABA services, they can right away meet the person uh, that they're going to be doing community follow-up uh, type of thing with. Uh, and in some cases where it made sense, uh, there, w there had been some, some merging of staff. For example, Children's Hospital um, determined it didn't make sense for them to manage services ongoing that were in a community. So those, those staff became part of Rehab Center for Children's staff. But for the most part, the seven agencies have maintained their uh, organizational autonomy. And it seems to be working fine. All right. Um, Donna is uh, asking if you have a, a day patient therapy program for children from rural areas, and if so, where do they stay? You did mention in part of the, the site selection process included making sure it was close to hotels and, and those sorts of services for uh, people from uh, out of town and rural areas, but uh, do you have other facilities for them? Uh, well, it, children who need um, sort of inpatient type rehab are basically in children's hospital until they're ready for discharge. And then at that point, they are picked up by their community. Uh, so we have physio OT speech uh, services that are in, in uh, each rural region. Uh, some of those services are provided by our center on an outreach type uh, basis. Um, and children who would come to the city for service would basically be coming for appointments. Uh, we try and cluster their appointments, so if they are here for the day, they, they are basically at Sky Center for the day. Uh, so we have a family kitchen built in uh, for them so that they can have their lunch and that kind of thing here. And as you saw around the building, very various quiet areas, waiting areas, gaming systems, resource centers, things that they can do while they're here for the day. Uh, but there, we don't have kids that would come to the city, say, for five days in a row or, or something like that. You mentioned uh, just on one of the slides it said something it made mention of respite services. Is there sort of in inpatient type respite services for families to access? There are uh, at Saint Amant, so not at Sky Center, but Saint Amant does have uh, inpatient respite services. Um, some, if they're very very specialized, are uh, are available at Children's Hospital as well. And then out of Sky Center, there are a variety of different kinds of out. Uh, outreach respite services that go into people's homes either through pediatric home for care or Department of Family Services or Community Respite Services which is one of our um, respite providers that uh, is actually operates out of Sky Center. The other thing we do have in terms of respite is some respite camps for people. So stepping out of Saturdays is for example a respite camp for children with FASD. Uh, so they're here for six hours on a Saturday uh, once or twice a month. Uh, which gives their, their family a break, but also allows us in a group type setting to address um, various uh, social skills and self-regulation and those kinds of topics that are, are of interest to uh, uh, kids with FAS or to their parents. <laughs> 
Um, Ari is asking if you've run into issues where staff salaries were not equivalent. So, for example, where a social worker might have been paid more by one agency than the other, and then during the, mal the amalgamation, how was that handled? Yeah, and uh, for the most part, because people have their own employers, where there's not too much comparing going on. We, we've kind of been used to working this way at Rehab Center for Children, uh, where we had some other agencies coming in even in advance of, of this, and we have you know, even within RCC, we have five different bargaining units. So uh, for the most part, there's central bargaining in Winnipeg, which means a lot of the healthcare kind of funded agreements are negotiated centrally. Which, So for example, the therapists coming from Children's Hospital were already on the same salary scale as the therapists coming from Rehab Center for Children. So where there's been really equivalent unions and equivalent uh, job descriptions, there, there hasn't been that kind of discrepancy. And so far, it really has not emerged as any kind of issue. Um, because we have separate separate employers, people kind of accept that. Yeah, that was the next question that came in was around unions. Were, were there? So you mentioned there were different bargaining unions, but it doesn't sound like the uh, the unions were really an issue as far as the amalgamation. Or were there any other issues related to uh, working with the different unions? We did a lot of work up front with the unions, kind of just talking to them about this uh, as, it, as we've been going along. So this has been years in the making, uh, as we said. So uh, this was not a big surprise to anybody. Uh, nobody lost jobs over this. It was just, um, you know, working in a different location for the most part uh, and accepting the fact that there were a number of different employers in the building. and. Um, you know, for the staff that were becoming RCC staff from Children's Hospital staff, we had to do a little more work uh, and making sure that nobody lost anything in that transfer. But, but that was our principle. We didn't want staff to lose anything uh, in coming, coming in here. So uh, for the most part, uh, we had great cooperation from the unions because that's their principle as well. Um, and, um, and yeah, we, we haven't had problems. I think it raises a very good question, however. Um, very early on in Sky, when we were developing the task teams that we talked about, we developed a task team deliberately around communication. And so at our intersectoral table with all partners, we did a lot of brainstorming, identifying who were the stakeholders that we needed to communicate with throughout this integration process, whether it was about work redesign, whether it was about salary scales, whether it was about space, and so on. Um, that communication plan was staged and reviewed regularly and certainly included all of the bargaining units. So at no point was there a surprise. We really worked hard at making sure all stakeholders were engaged at a meaningful level long before the building was actually approved. We also reviewed floor plans and things with unions so that they could see exactly where their staff was moving into. And for the most part, staff were really excited to be coming here. They've been involved in the planning. They're excited for the opportunity to work with the other staff that they talk to on the phone all the time. Uh, and it's, it's been a really positive experience uh, for staff um, just being able to go down the hall and, and talk to that person. Uh, so I think um, you know the labor environment feels pretty good here. All right. Well, we have one more question. We are just about out of time. We just have a, just a couple minutes left, so we'll take this one last question. Um, Shelley is asking, what involvement do you have from the schools that your children attend? Or she, then she asks, are, are the children all, or are the children all preschool age? I, which I don't think is the case, but she's wondering what what involvement have the schools had? Yeah, no, we have a lot of school-age children as well. The services go kind of right up from zero to age 21. Uh, and so we're engaged with the school divisions on a number of different uh, levels, kind of at the very planning level. Uh, the school divisions are all involved on our Children's Therapy Initiative uh, Committee. So they're part of that joint system planning around uh, how therapy services are delivered uh, to school divisions. Uh, Rehab Center for Children, in fact, has contracts with a number of school divisions to be the deliverer of those services. So for Winnipeg School Division, which is the largest one in Winnipeg, we actually deliver those services, so we're involved in that level. Also, the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority has a joint kind of VP-type superintendent level meeting uh, on a regular basis uh, with the school division where some of that bigger, broader kind of planning happens around uh, school-aged uh, services as well. Uh, additionally, um, we, we have pretty good observation capacity built into some of our rooms and stuff. So if there is a particular um, 
educational assistant or teachers who are working with a child and we want to bring them in uh, as part of learning how to use different pieces of equipment or attending workshops on board maker or things like that. We have many school teams that come in uh, and actually do training around uh, children specific uh, type issues um, as well as having our OTs, physios and speech people out in the schools. Um, also, we also have school therapy interest groups. So if there's school divisions who are employing their own therapists, they're still connected in with us in terms of broader kind of uh, education and standard setting and, and that kind of thing as well. Uh, so multiple levels of involvement. Right, and with that, I think we'll wrap it up, and maybe we'll just send it, hand it back to you, uh, to both of you, for for any closing final comments. I mean, maybe even as a suggestion, you had that last slide you put up about uh, sort of the vision forward, the next steps. You had really some some great uh, your your eyes on some great topics there: the community uh, services for the First Nations communities, the transition to adult services, mental wellness. I mean, those are some real hot button issues across the country. Um, any any thoughts? Uh, any final thoughts you want to leave the audience with going forward, and, and maybe even about sort of what the future holds or what some of those next steps are for the Sky Center? Yeah, I mean, we're very excited about the First Nations work that we're now engaged in. We've, uh, you know, through the Jordan's principal funding through Health Canada, have an opportunity to actually be uh, uh, providing service to any of those First Nation communities who want uh, us to uh, bring services uh, to those communities or, or, or work, work with them to develop uh, therapy services on those communities. So that's, that's a great initiative we're really uh, uh, excited about taking forward. Uh, we're also going kind of into a revisioning uh, phase uh, to just, you know, kind of put some more concrete tasks around those uh, th those next steps as well. And I guess I would also just want to add, if any of you are in Winnipeg and want to come and take a take a look, uh, feel free to contact us. We'd be happy to to show you around and and talk more about it. All right. And Jeanette, any any final comments from yourself? I totally uh, support uh, Cheryl's last comments. For me, having traveled with this since the outset, it's really important to never think the job is done. And so if integration is a process, we need to make sure that our services are always evidence-informed, client and family-centered, uh, and we are constantly paying attention to authentic engagement of all of our partners as well as our service recipients. So those values will hold us uh, true to where we need to go in the future. All right. Well, thank you very much for a great uh, great presentation. I think it's really a, a great example for the rest of the country to look at for any centers or regions or ministries that are thinking about going down this path and integrating services in this way. I think uh, the, the Sky Center is certainly a great model to look at, and I hope people do go out and visit. Uh, from those of those that I know that have visited the center said it is quite a beautiful, uh, beautiful new facility. So uh, congratulations on all your great work. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so with that, we'll close off. Uh, we do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time, and it's always great when you can watch live as those questions and comments, as we heard today, really enrich the discussion. But when you can't watch live, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we do record all of these sessions and make them available after the fact on the Knowledge Exchange Network uh, at ken.cassie.org. Uh, coming up uh, next Wednesday on January 25th, we will hear from Dr. Lonnie Zwagenbaum from the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital in Edmonton, where he will talk about timely autism diagnosis considerations across the lifespan. This presentation will review uh, progress in approaches to early diagnosis with special reference to early signs and experience with diagnostic assessment of uh, younger siblings of children with ASD. Um, we will also discuss uh, progress in assessment approaches and service models aimed at more timely diagnosis of ASD across the lifespan. So that'll be a great uh, session for many of you who have uh, participated in today's webinar. And then following that, on the, the very next day on Thursday, uh, on January 26th, we will have part four of our special six-part series, Life with a Preterm Baby, uh, that we are doing in collaboration with the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation and sponsored by Prolacta Bioscience. Uh, part four is called uh, Feeding, Feeding Your Baby in the NICU and we will hear from Tammy McBride from Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto and Kate Robson, uh, my co-host on that series and also from Sunnybrook Health Center, uh, where they will be sharing information about feeding babies in the, NI in, in the NICU and preparing for discharge home. Uh, they'll also talk about topics like early hand expression, pump 
prepping tips and tricks, transitioning to oral feeding, breastfeeding after discharge, and many other questions of interest to both parents and uh, caregivers in the NICU. So a uh, great session. Uh, and uh, you know, and for more of the episodes in that Life with a Preterm Baby series, please go uh, again uh, to the Knowledge Exchange Network and uh, check all that out. So some great stuff coming up. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. It's a great audience and a great presentation. Thanks to our presenters again. And we hope to see you back here next week. Bye, everyone.